for asexual, usually they keep in diploid numbers. Whereas in sexual reproduction, then each gamete needs to come as a haploid, and when they fuse, they become a diploid organism. That's why meiosis is involved in sexual reproduction. In asexual, you need only one parent. Let's say you have a plantain, you have your onion, most usually in plants. You find out that there will be no fusion, and just one plant can give rise to another set of young ones. So there is no need for two gametes coming from either a male or a female, and there is no need for fusion or fertilization. So in your statement, we say no fertilization, fusion of gametes or zygote formed. But under sexual reproduction, there is fertilization that occurs or uh, zygote is formed. Now, offsprings are identical in asexual because it's one parent giving rise to the same organism. And it's the same chromosome that has replicated and giving rise through cell division. You find out that the daughter cells or the daughter or the offspring always resemble or are exactly, uh, exactly in the same way like the mother. But when it comes to sexual reproduction, because new had its own replication, other things were crossing over and everything from his side, the female has also had its own crossing over recombinations on the other side. Once they fuse, even the two set of chromosomes coming, there would have to be dominance, recombination. So the character that may come out will produce an offspring that is neither the mother or the father. So the offspring may not look like any, uh, may not look exactly like any of the parents because definitely there will be passing of genes left and right mixed up. So we say that offsprings vary genetically from either the father alone. If you compare the offspring and the father alone, there will be some variation. You compare the offspring and the mother alone, there will be variation. But in the asexual part, you find out that it is only the mother that they are comparing the offsprings to. So it's only one parent they are comparing to the offspring. So in that sense, it's easy to compare. You find that they are the same. Because you don't need another parent, you don't need another parent to be involved in asexual reproduction. The reproduction is so fast because they are, in they are on either if it's a bad, if it's a cell division, uh, binary fission, sporulation, fragmentation, uh, partenogenesis or partenocopy, any of them happens so rapidly, so fast that they can just give rise to new ones. But with the sexual reproduction, you need a male to meet a female. You need a gamut, let's say a sperm, to travel through some time to meet the egg. You need conditions. So it's slow in sexual reproduction to give rise to a new organism. If you take human beings and most time, most sexual reproduction, few organisms are produced. Even with the external fertilization, the reason why they also fertilize externally and produce a lot of eggs and a lot of sperm is that there's always a tendency that some of the sperm will not meet the egg. Some of the fertilized uh, zygote may not get the condition necessary to survive. So by the end of the day, the number of organisms they produce are usually few as compared to a lot of asexual reproduction. So the last point is more individuals are produced, fewer individuals are produced. Before that point, watch, rapid as again slow. So if you're able to understand, you don't rush in the exams, and you would be able to gather your thoughts 
sketch your answers on a paper, you can easily get five marks. Always, most time when we ask is four or five marks. You can easily get this mark with ease. Now let's start today's lesson. On your screen, I give you about 30 seconds or one minute to have a recap of the male reproductive structure as shown on your diagram. Study the parts, the names, and I'll tell you what mostly we want in the exams. Okay. As I said at the beginning, revision show. So let's go straight to how we want it in the exams. They may ask you for parts and their functions, or they can also ask you to describe. So today we'll look at the description aspect of the male reproductive structure. First, we have our testes covered in our scrotum. So you may say there are, there's a scrotal sac that houses two testes. Then if they go on to ask you for adaptation, immediately you mention a structure, you mention the function. So first, scrotal sac is what? To cover and to house as a form of protection. It also covers it and uh, gives it the warmth it needs because of where it is positioned and the nature of the wrinkle nature of it. The next is the testis. It is adaptation. You will see in adaptation, you describe the structure. It's ovoid shape, testis. Their main function is to produce the sperm and the male sex hormone, the testosterone. If it's description, we just go on to say the scrotal sac houses two testes. Within each testes are tubular structures like this inside. We call the seminiferous tubule. Actually, when we say testis produces sperm, it is the seminiferous tubules within that have the ability to undergo the cells there, the germinal layer cells there, have the ability to undergo what we call spermatogenesis. Second, they also have interstitial cells that help produce some hormones. So these ones, so when we say the testis, it's correct. But when you go deep, you can say the seminiferous tubule. When the seminiferous tubule's job is pro the production of sperm, when they produce, they don't keep it there. They pass it on to this structure we call the epididymis. So from here, we move into the epididymis, which I have labeled on your screen here, like a quail tubule on top of the, something that looks like a calabash. So it's like calabash and the lid. So inside the calabash, we produce the sperm. Sometimes covering as the lid, there is called the epididymis. Their job is to store the sperm and wait for it to mature. So sperms produced for seminiferous are not matured. They get there, they mature. They go there with a lot of fluid. By the time, most of the fluid is absorbed and becomes thicker. So at that same stage, the sperms have the ability to learn how to be motor, but they don't move away until ejaculation. So for epididymis, we store them, sperm production takes almost more than two months. And when it is ready, through stimulation, it has to pass through this tube called a sperm duct. Some will name it as vas deferens. So it's through this vas deferens or sperm duct, the sperm will travel 
in this direction to the ureter. So once it crosses from here, it's becoming the ureter. So from where I've ended over here, we are starting the ureter. Just at the base of the ureter connecting the bladder, we have glands over there. One is a uh, seminal vesicle, another is a carpus gland, and another is a prostate gland. These three secret separate juices. When ejaculation starts and the nose sperm would move, at the junction where the sperm that joins the ureter, that Y junction, you find out that these three glands start to secrete juices into the sperm that is passing. And all of them have their functions, but together the fluid is called the seminal fluid. And we'll look at each of them, their function. So this is how it looks easy for you to look at it from the one on your right. And you see the bladder is connected to the same tube. And the sperm tube is also connected to that same tube. So we call it the unigenital organ because it does two things. Bring sperm and also help us urinate. Okay. Now let's look at the notes, which I've already described. So in the exams, we want to see the word scrotal sac and the word testis and its function. Then attached to the testis was supposed to be the seminiferal, inside the, it's the seminiferal tubo. And I said it is stored, the sperms are stored in the epidermis. Then this spermatic cord actually is connected at the epidermis when we want sperm to move out. Then I spoke about these three glands, the semin sem uh, seminal vesicle, carpus gland, and the, sem uh, the prostate gland. Now, in exams, they may not actually access where they are attached. All they want to you to say is that they secrete a juice called seminal fluid. But in section A, they usually may ask what is the function of each fluid? Now the seminal vesicles juice or liquid they secrete is actually to nourish the sperm. Kind of food, it gives it food and the food will give it some kind of energy enough for it to move. Now the prostate, its job is to neutralize any form of acid, usually when we urinate, there are traces or little drops that sometimes may stay in our urethra. So before the sperm can come, which may be which is alkaline, we will need to clear the place and turn the place to the alkaline medium so that the sperm can move. If not, the acid would have to neutralize. So someone has to come and clear, neutralize all the acid. And that is the job of the prostate gland. Now the carpus one is to secrete slimy fluid that lubricates the urethra to make passage so easy for the sperm to quickly move. So these are the, the rules of each of them. But if they ask you what fluid do these glands produce, then that becomes the seminal fluid. The fluid plus the sperm together is what we term as the semen. So what men ejaculate is not sperm. How we mistakenly say it, it's not sperm. For your eyes can't see the sperm. So in the exams, if they don't let you describe the actual what's the general function of the male reproductive structures, one is just to produce our sperm for fertilization. Two, develop, uh, to deliver the sperm to the appropriate place, that means to enter the female vagina and release the sperm into it. 
And as I started, I told the testes have other cells, like interstitial cells, that produces hormones. So the male productive releasing sperm and also producing the male hormones. On your screen is the common one they also bring. Usually this one is brought more because it's easy to draw, but students make easy mistakes with this drawing. And let's look at what we make. First, the first word has to be the diagram, not a drawing. So the title has to be a diagram, not a drawing. And keep this. If you are writing your theory papers and there's a drawing, use the word diagram because you don't have the object in front of you. But if you are in the practicals where the organism is placed in front of you, all practical papers usually they prefer the word drawing. Though they can accept diagram, but they mostly go for the drawing. The theory examiners go for the diagram. So diagram of, for this drawing, what student got wrong was the head. If you read your notes, well, the head is very big. The head is very big. So if we give you six to eight, as opposed to at least draw about four to five centimeters the size of the head. They manage to draw the other part, the tail and the middle in such a way that it curves a little bit. So most times students will draw a small. Two, the nucleus is big and the cytoplasm is small compared to the female egg. So we'll look out for this because they expect that your theory you know is represented here. So let's look at what we have, a head, a middle piece, and you have the tail portion. These are sometimes what we mark. Other times we go deeper. For the students, we show us what we call the axial filament and the mitochondrion. So I presented three drawings. Just have a look at it so that we go to the functions of each part. For the middle drawing, if you go to exam and say using an illustrative diagram, describe a sperm. They don't mean go and write a whole essay. Draw the thing, label a part, put all your notes in a bracket, aside each label. So if it's acrosome, what does acrosome have and what do they do? It's a lytic enzyme. Their job is to dissolve the membrane of the egg so that the head can penetrate. Full stop. You've described it beside the drawing. That is an illustrative diagram. So they didn't say go and write or draw first and go and write. So the middle drawing there is an illustrative diagram. So we brought all this so that in the exam you could answer your questions well. Now let's look at the functions or the parts. We saw the head, and the head actually contains the nucleus. And what is the function of the nucleus? Contains the chromosome. At this stage, the haploid chromosomes. And every nucleus also controls the activity of a cell. Okay. Then the acrosome, the tip of the Sperm we saw had a portion labeled acros, a tip or the anterior part, which I said contain lytic enzymes, which are the ability to dissolve the membrane to allow the one, the only one that dissolved its head to enter and the rest to all stay behind. Then we saw a place called the middle piece. It is the portion that actually contains the mitochondria or mitochondria. And the, the job of mitochondria, we say, is the powerhouse to supply energy for the sperm to be able to move. Now, in some few exams we marked, they may look for axial filament. It is actually the, it connects the head and the tail together. And 
contribute to the whip-like movement of the tail. And as we said, the tail itself is the one that would have to move left, right, or whip the watery medium to help the watery medium propel it, move through the cervix, through the urethra, where it has to go to meet the egg. So we are about to switch on to the female. Let's look at the female drawing first. Also, in all cases, I give you the one that we can easily draw in the exams. All these have been marked in our exams as being correct. You can draw the whole organism's body and label it. You can only remove the productive part, leaving the body part out. And it's also accepted. For the males, we mostly prefer this particular one, the one on your left. It's easy to understand this one more than the one on your right. So let's look at part vulva vagina, cervix, urethra, ovary, oviduct, and the funnel of the oviduct. You can see it shown in all the other parts too. Okay. Now, if you're asked to describe some start from the ovary section to the fallopian to comes the vagina, others start from the vagina to the other part. It's the same. So I start from the ovary part. So it, we say that it consists of two ovaries located just below the kidney of the wall. It's dorsally placed at our back. And close to each of the ovaries, we saw the funnels leading into the fallopian tube or the oviduct. So let's go back. So this is what we are saying, and this is the funnel. So they are cilia-like structures or hair-like structures we call the frimbia here, and they are cilia within the oviduct. So it's not touching in that sense, there's a space. So the ovary will have to pass through the ovary that, and from this zone, we come to the urethra. From the urethra, we go to the cervix, and from cervix, we go to the vagina. And what covers the front of the vagina usually is what we call the vulva. So back to our notes. So we saw two ovaries. Close to them are the ov ovidat funnel. And the ovidat funnel is uh, opens or continues with the ovidat, where the egg will have to pass. It's that same place to egg usually are fertilized. Now, why do we say egg pass? Uh, and during ovulation, egg has to be released to, let me say, move slowly through the over that to get to the urethra, uh, the womb. Now from the uterus, we have to join the vagina, but the uterus narrows down to something we call the neck. And that neck is what we call the cervix. It's very narrow, and spans have to swim hard to pass through that barrier to go through the uterus. So, another thing I supposed to also know is that our female structure is somehow from the dorsal, we said that the dorsal placed at the lower abdomen, but it mostly sits in the pelvic zone where the bones are. So it's kind of protected or covered or housed within the pelvic region. 
I also mentioned that the front of the vagina is covered with the vulva, but at the tip of the vulva is what we call the clitoris, which is sensitive to stimulation. So what we just did was a description. You can start from, as I said, the vagina and say it's a long tube that tapers into what we call the cervix, called the neck, which leads into the uh, womb or uterus. Then the uterus also branches to the left and right through the fallopian tube, to the fallopian funnel, to the egg. In exam students, and they can go straight to ask you the functions, which has happened twice or so. So on your screen, we have straightforward functions. If they ask you for the ovary, what is the function of the ovary? The ovary actually contains the ova or the egg itself. The ovary is where we produce the egg once a month. Then the same ovary, when we start looking at the menstruations, uh, menstrual cycle, we'll see there's a stage that they produce some hormones too, called estrogen and progesterone. They are usually refer to the sex hormones, and they also contribute to the secondary sexual characteristics of female. The vagina we saw, which I say is a long tube, the main function of the vagina is to receive the penis. At the same time, if penis releases sperm, it first has to settle in the vagina before it travels. When there is birth, when I give him birth, that place the stand for babies to pass through. When there's menstrual flow, it's that same place that the blood will flow out. So if they go to the exams, calm down and just think about what goes on over there to be able to write your point. And I said the vulva is like the lips or the tip the lips of the vagina. So I said that it covers or is the entrance to the vagina. Far cervix, as I said, is the neck or we say the lower end of the uterus. Now what is the function of the uterus too? It's where egg, fertilized egg gets implanted and develops into the ovary. So at the point is for implantation. Second, that's where it houses the ovary or the fetus. Then, when we get to development, we'll see how placenta is made and all the four embryonic membranes are found around it. Then the same uterus at a stage will provide food till placenta is formed. Then, it protects the embryo from mechanical injury. If they ask what's the function of the funnel, which is funny, the way it looks like, its job is to receive the egg. In the proper class, when we get there, you see the frimbia and other things moving left and right in the video, and you see that it kind of hold or kind of pull the egg that is rupturing from the ovary slowly into the oviduct. And the ovidus main function is just a passageway for the egg to move. Okay. Now, we come to a point we are going to go at the menstrual cycle. Hardly are we asked students to describe the whole menstrual cycle but we have a funny way of asking it in section A and section B. We mostly prefer asking the hormones and what they do. Students also usually get confused with this menstrual cycle. We are going to look at a simplified version, a four-stage structure of how menstrual cycle is. Two, we are using a 28-day average calendar. It differs from people. So we are very careful how we, we deduce things. Okay. 
So let me do the teaching, then we'll go to the notes for how we write it in exams. So I've given you a chart on the left and the whole cycle going 28 days. So on 28 day, we assume the blood starts or there's a menstrual flow. And that becomes day one, though it's the ending of another, becomes day one for the next cycle. Immediately, the body knows that we are there was no fertilization. We are going to start the menses on that day one. In our brain, there is what we call the hypothalamus. And the pituitary gland. Just beneath the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus first because it's part of the brain knowing what is happening, it's going to instruct the main part of the brain as the organ, the gland in charge for this menstrual cycle, that's the pituitary. So for him to instruct, for hypothalamus to instruct, it needs to send a hormone to go and kind of wake them up or tell them that, so checking my whole body, nothing happened. So we need to start a new process. That one, the hypothalamus releases what we call gonadotropic releasing hormone. So GNRH. It's a releasing hormone. It's not the main job. Then it comes to activate the pituitary that go and work. The pituitary will have to send two hormones from the pituitary gland itself, just beneath the brain, travel to our blood to get to our ovaries. That two hormones collectively is called the gonadotropin hormone. Some would some have gonadotrophic hormone or gonadotropin hormone. We mark all in the exams. These two, gonadotropic hormone, now I don't add the releasing anymore. If I'm talking about the pituitary, these two are the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. Again, so the gonadotropin hormone or gonadotrophic hormone are the follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone. So mostly we write that F, S, H, and L, H. What is the job? The word follicle. We are not going to go to genesis. But once the egg, the blood is being shed through the menstrual time, we will find out that day one there is maybe blood flow, day two there is blood flow, three, maybe seven days, five days to seven days you have blood flow. Me, all this time the blood is flowing, they have the one of the ovary has started work. And there are a group of small cells there with one oocyte inside. So these small cells got the follicle, are stimulated to be active and start functioning. We didn't say they are dead, but during a certain stage, we arrest their production. Now they are waking, they are active, and they gather around one oocyte, the egg to be. So for the hormone that triggers these follicle cells to start working, it's what we call the follicle stimulating. So it's stimulating the follicles that seem to be asleep or was arrested at a certain stage, you will see why, to become active and start functioning. And after seven days, so we call the follicular phase, we call the follicle is working. After the menses is almost done, this follicle with the one egg will start growing, and there will be a wall form around called the theca. The theca. So, on your chart, 
on this chart, the one on your left, you find that the one nothing. Then we see follicle growing with egg inside growing and maturing. All this while they've given us a body temperature, the anterior pituitary hormones that are secreted. Remember that it was follicle stimulate, which is the green one, and luteinizing is the blue one. Immediately, because follicle was the one working, you will see the follicle level is higher than luteinizing. Now, follicle will do its work. The fluid, follicular fluid will form inside this whole cell. The theca becomes, will be thicker formed. Then once the theca is formed around, it's not like it's formed, it's the wall of the whole structure of the follicle. Once it knows the menses is done, the oocyte is growing. It's maturing gradually. It sends the first hormone from that theca or the wall. The theca is the wall around the follicle. Then tissues within the ovary. Itself, these two will send a hormone called estrogen. Remember that the first two hormones came from the brain, but this hormone is coming from the ovary or the egg itself. So we have hormones from the brain and hormones, hormones from the ovary. So this hormone is called the estrogen. So the estrogen's job is to go, we use the word repair, uh, use the word repair, remake, when, it, when the menses was going on, we had to pull some tissues, some blood vessels were destroyed. These glandular and vascular structures are remade, put intact, so that the whole process can. So that is done by estrogen. When the estrogen is also being produced, the egg will start to grow and grow and grow. But to get to its proper maturity, we will need the luteinizing hormone to mature that follicular cell to the mature stage. When it gets to the mature stage, there are a lot of changes in it. So the new whole structure is no more called a follicle structure or cell. It's now called a graphene follicle. So from folli follicle and its oocyte or the follicular stage or follicle cell, we move to the graphene follicle. At the graphene, we say that we are at maturity, almost to maturity. And the hormone that is helping us build to the maturity is what we call the luteinizing hormone, the LH. When it helps it build up to that stage and it ruptures the egg on the 14th day, which is called the ovulation, that means over, egg is moving, ovulation then it moves to the fallopian. Immediately it moves out of the graphene, out of the ovary into the fallopian. Remember that it was, a s as I began, I said there's a small cells with one egg, the oocyte. It's the egg that is gone. But the cells with the wall, everything stayed behind. But these cells and its wall is not as it started. There are some changes that are taking place. So the new structure that we found after the egg has left is what we call the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum then will also begin to secrete hormones knowing that the egg has been released. And that hormone it releases is what we call the progesterone. Its function is to go double thicken or triple thicken the endometrium because it anticipates the, the egg is going to be fertilized to become that. So progesterone goes to prepare, prepare the body for anticipation of pregnancy. Remember that these one also came from the corpus lithium. That is the remaining, the, uh, the remainder structure or remaining structure after the egg has left. So this one also comes from the ovary cell. Be careful how they ask this question. So we have hormones from the brain, hormones from the ovary itself. So the corpus luteum, which is a yellow body, will then let progesterone go up and will start to decline follicle and estrogen gradually. So that follicle, if you don't decline follicle, let it go down. 
it will start another egg all over again. So we don't like that. So we stop it. So once one egg is going on, finish, and we are in the ovulation, new one can start until we get to another end of a menses. So all this side was the follicular stage, but on the 14th day is the ovulation where the egg is released and they say that there's a danger zone that fertilization can take place. So this is a simplified thing. From the 14th day, if no fertilization takes place within three days, we say the egg becomes inactive and the journey is on so it gets into the uterus awaiting another menstruation. Then the whole cycle starts all over again. So all that I said, let's look at how we present in the exams. So menstrual cycle has four main distinction. We say the maturation of the ovum, the thickening of the uterine endometrium, maintaining the endometrium for receiving fertilized egg. If it does not, then there's the breakdown. So in exams, we start saying that the first day we have the menses that begin at the follicular stage. Then I mentioned gonadotropic release hormone from the hypothalamus, forcing or causing the pituitary to release its hormone called the follicular and luteinizing. Quick, the FSH, FSH, FSH will cause the ovary follicle to start to develop and gather around one immature egg at that time and that become the follicle stage. At this stage, a wall is formed around the follicle and this wall will send hormone called the estrogen. So what do we want to see in the exams? The GnRH, FSH, and LH. Then the word, the follicle begins. If you can't say the thicker and you can say the ovary or the ova releases the estrogen, it's accepted. Then the job of the estrogen is to repair, as I said, thickening of the uterus, that endometrium, and forming gland. And the luteinizing causes the follicle to mature to the stage we call the graphene follicle. Then I told that graphene will move when it's mature to the edge of the ovary, rapture the place, then it gets into the fallopian. When it gets into the fallopian, we say that the LH will start to drop, the FSH also start to drop because the corpus lit lithium. So because of the lithium, we call the luteal stage the luteal stage. After the 14th day, the stage going is called the luteal stage because the progesterone produced is going to double, triple, make the endometrium thicker. So from corpus, the word we want to see is corpus. For graphene to corpus, corpus to progesterone. Then say it prepares the body, hoping that there will be fertilization. You also mentioned that progesterone also builds the body. That the estrogen also builds the body. Progesterone also builds the body. So progesterone and estrogen are the two sex hormones for sexual characteristics. If there's no fertilization, then we get into menstruation. And you describe menstruation as the slotting of kind of remover, crashing of the uterine, extra uterine endometrial tissues form during the process. Remember that estrogen will repair, progesterone will come and double, triple. This whole thing has to be moved together with the ovary, uh, the ova, and crushed as egg and discharged to come out. But if something should happen that the sperm should meet the egg at that time, which I've described as the process of fertilization, Remember that we said that it's what? The sperm, it happens in the chest at ovulation. It takes about one to three days, just at the ovulation. So around the 14th day, and sperm can also stay three days before that time, awaiting it. So the many sperms you see, the only one with the acrosome, 
would be able to penetrate the cover, the zona pellucida. Once it just touches it, manage to penetrate first, it sends some kind of chemical reaction that makes the whole cover impenetrable by any of the other sperms. So nobody can get inside, only one, as you've seen on your screen. The rest will just be outside and can't do anything. Now that we have the fertilization taking, has taken place, still we are in the oviduct. This cell, which is the egg, fertilized egg, now will start to divide into cells. Into cells. That division is called the cleavage. That division of cells, we use the word cleavage. They will divide, but the cells will never grow big. They will remain, the whole egg will still maintain a size. There's no proper change. The first, fourth mitotic division will lead to 16, mostly we call it the morala stage. If it divides to the seventh stage, which will give about 128, there are about cells. Then we have gone to the blastocyst stage. Then we go to the grastula. But in essence, we teach only blastocyst. So the first division, the cleavage, will lead us to blastocyst, a group of cells. Now let's hold on here, take a break. When we come back, we'll take over from the development stage and continue. So let's go take water and come back. that you can't free yourself from the clutches of exam or practice. The main problem is that you are scared. Scared of having poor results in an exam. You lack confidence in your ability to achieve higher score on your own. Now, let me tell you how you can help yourself to stop examination or practice as a student. One, read, read, and read over. I understand that you have probably been reading but haven't achieved good results. Hence, your reason for being here. But you need to realize that your method of reading may have been the reason you are not achieving the best results. Before reading, try having a thinking session about the topic. This will spare your curiosity on what the topic is all about, thereby driving you to invest yourself in reading. Reading this way will help you do better and decrease the edge to want to cheat in exams. You should make sure you are well prepared for the exams you are going to write. Two, do not keep friends who cheat. If you are being honest with yourself, the reason you are engaging in more practice is that it is what your friends are doing. If they were absent in your life, the chances of you doing it on your own are low. Whenever there's an exams going on, stay away from your acquaintances who cheat. And if possible, cut off every relationship you have with them. Friends like that are not what you need to make changes. Having them in your life will only make you go back to your old habits. The solution you need is to keep away from those friends that keep dragging you into the path of more practice. Three, pay attention. This can be one of the hardest thing for a student to do. It's either a scene from a movie that keeps popping into your head or you are daydreaming about a certain life you want for yourself in class. To fully understand when reading, paying attention in class is the key. Any student who pays attention and understands a topic will have no use for more practice. Do you have problems concentrating in class? Okay, let me show you what to do. One, make eye contact with the teacher. This will force you to listen to what he or she is saying. Two, put away your phone. Three, have enough sleep before the class. Four, 
Try participating in class discussions to get you invested in the happenings so that even when your focus tries slipping you off, the discussion group can draw back your attention. And then five, drink cold water from time to time in class to rejuvenate you. Four, keep good friends. The power of peer pressure can't be overlooked. To change a habit, keep company with those who see it as immoral and bad. And with time, you will see yourself frowning at the idea of cheating. Do you want to be the best? Then work with the best. No matter how good a particular seed is, its growth is dependent on having good soil. Your kind of friends will either encourage or discourage you. So choose well. Once you have got some good friends, ensure you maintain them. The type of friends you keep has a way of influencing your lifestyle. If you work with people that are constantly on serious, you too may be negatively influenced, despite your efforts to change. Five, don't see an exams as a do or die affair. See preparations as do or die before your exams, not the exam itself. See exams as a preparation for life beyond school. Life after the four walls of the classroom is another turbulent stage. You need to be as firm and decisive as possible before you begin to face real life challenges. How you use your four or five years in school matters. This will tell if you will struggle with the time management and other skills required for you to be successful out there. Six, know that values and good conscience are more precious than grades. You know the countless times you have decided to change for the better, but ended up with a statement like, this week is gone. <laughs> Let me pursue this goal next week. Having solutions to your academic problem is one thing. Having an interest in solving it is another thing. You can only be eager to resist partaking in exam smart practice when you know the harms it does to you. Overcoming the temptation of more practice make you become an outstanding personality. You will be able to believe in yourself better defend your results anywhere, and also get access to scholarships abroad. Seven, sit in the first row always. If you know you don't want anyone to ask you questions or distract you, you should sit in the first row to deter anyone from speaking to you. This could even motivate you to study every day. There's no doubt you will have all the time to yourself in this section of the hall. Although students sitting in the front row might still communicate, but the distraction is always less in front. Whatever sitting positions you have always used while writing exams or tests, I advise that you change it now to sit in the front row. How can you think of quitting when you are in the safe zone where no one can catch you cheating? Eight, it is more honorable to be an honest average student. <laughs> yes. It is better to be an original average student than to be a fake excellent student. What gives you the assurance that what you are copying from another student is even the right thing? Think about having some time in prison for something that could have been avoided. So, try to do the best you can in avoiding more practices. In whatever capacity where you are faced with an examination, make up your mind never to succeed through unhealthy means there's always a right way to achieve your academic goals. Nine, you need great discipline. Self-discipline entails preparing yourself adequately. Read your notes, test books, solve past questions, mingle with the best students in your class, and get close to your teachers. 10, think about the efforts of your sponsors. A very important reason to desist from examination more practice is the shame you bring to yourself and your sponsors if caught. Think about how you would speak to them when you are called upon to explain why you have been expelled from school. They must have spent a lot trying to keep you in school and getting you educated. Don't shatter their plans for you by becoming a school dropout due to expulsion. Stay glued to Joy Learning TV and enjoy more episodes on how to avoid examination more practice with your favorite coach, Tina. Do well to follow us on all our social media platforms. Till I see you again, peace out.
is a clue and so I was getting down for the stairs. So I used two of my hands, I separated them and so when I was getting down, the hand I used to protect myself actually fall and get injured. Some kids there, they laugh at me and say that I can't walk. Some some call me a dog. I don't know what to say it, but my this school is school than than the others, my schools. They treat me like their own. I want to be one of the greatest artists in the world. And I want to be a car designer. to go to school and learn to learn. I want to see, I want to be a better person in the future. Hello, welcome back. Our lovely viewers who has been with us at the beginning. If you just join us, you've not missed much. We just start with reproduction, gone through the structures, gone through the menstrual cycle, and highlighted what we want, especially the hormones. We're on the development stage. Call a friend if he's not here. And at the end, we'll have our question and answer section. All what I'm teaching, you may need them. So we got to the development of the embryo program for the break. We saw the sperm fertilizing and I said that there will be a cell division which does not result in the fertilized egg growing big. The cell is there doesn't grow. So it's a division that doesn't lead to growth. One divided to two, two gives us four, four gives us eight, eight gives us 16. There's a name for that one. Bar education jumps to the blastocyst, blastocyst system, which is the 128 cells. So we don't go through morula and grastula. So at blastocyst, which is what we do in education, the cells all of a sudden would arrange itself with an outer zone or some of the cells would rather be on the outer side. The outer group of cells slightly differ from those inside. So the name given to the outer group of cells is called the trophoblast. With time, these blastocysts will be hollow with fluid forming inside. But in exams, we are looking at exams now. In exams, this is what we want you to write. First, the cell division or cleavage, leading to the formation of a ball of a cell called blastocyst. Cells rearrange and leads to outer formation called trophoblast. All this while the cell is moving slowly to the uterus. Now, once they get to the uterus, they try to get hold on to the side. But almost close to getting there, there's these projections formed on the outer cells, which is called the trophoblast. We call the projections on it, we call it the villi. Remember, we've seen villi in digestion. We've also seen villi in the kidney. And we've seen villi on cells. So projections on these cells are called the villi. So here, because it's on the trophoblast, we call it the trophoblastic villi. These projections, when the egg gets into the womb, it helps penetrate and kind of hold the egg firmly within the uterus. This is what we term as the implantation. So a good student will usually ask, so when there's no fertilization and the normal egg, which has not been fertilized, get there, is it also called implantation? We mostly say no. Because the implantation is when the trophoblast really has 
penetrator held it and have the ability to now form all the layers and start to derive some nourishment and nutrients from the uterine walls. Which the normal egg, which has not been fertilized, don't, is even dead, let me call it that way, it's inactive and can't gain anything. So when this trophoblast with the villi get implanted, all of a sudden, the fertilized egg with a little yolk, they will feed on the yolk, and the zygote will also get nutrients from the uterus environment. There are fluids there. They will feed and gradually try to dissolve some of the uterine walls, the one they form thick. As they, they, they dissolve some drive out nutrient, they start to penetrate into it. So in exams, we don't expect you to describe all this. All that you say from the cleavage to the trophoblast to the villi, trophoblastic villi, bring in plantation. Then you say that together with the uterine walls and the embryo, they form membranes. What the four membranes they form are the choroin, allantois, the amniotic amion, and the yolk sac. These are the embryonic membranes. Then together with the uterine, they form what we call the placenta. So in the exams, we are more concerned not describing all how it forms. You say that a placenta is formed that connects the mother to the baby. But the baby itself is covered in four embryonic uh, layers. Because we use the word mammals, it differs in different organisms. There are slight differences, but we treat it as general. When you come to we human beings, there are rules for the placenta, there are rules for the amion, there are rules for the allantois, the yolk, and everything. We are going to look at it one after the other. Now, when the placenta forms, it forms with the choroin zone. The choroin, which is the one of the membrane around the embryo. The placenta on the other side, connecting the mother to that. These two, the placenta plus the choroin, and some of the allantois, they form a cord. So it becomes the zone at which the mother's body can connect with the baby. That's called the umbilical cord. So let me show you a picture. For you to get all that I'm talking about. So look at where the placenta is. Then, so that will be part of the placenta. But inside is the choroin zone, the placenta, which the choroin is part of the four embryonic membrane. And they fold or they twist around each other to form the umbilical cord. Meanwhile, there's a, a membrane, the blue line you see is the amniotic membrane that has produced a fluid called the amniotic fluid in which the baby lies. So take your time and look at it. I'm going to describe the functions of each. Now let's get the function of placenta. That what we saw there as a placenta, we say it touches the fetus to the uterine wall of the mother. Second, it absorbs food from the mother's blood and pass it on to the fetus. When our mothers eat, they need to feed the baby and it passes through the placenta. The next is that it carries oxygen. We breathe because our mothers breathe and bring us all these things to the fetus. When we also remove waste, these same waste are removed through the place, like fe uh, fetus waste such as excretion 
filthy waste, then carbon dioxide are all eliminated. Mothers would want, when the babies are not fully formed, making their own antibodies, it's the mother's antibodies that are given to them. So they also need to pass through. So remember the placenta zone, the colon, have formed that umbilical cord. So they pass through them. Most of the sound of the functions will be that of the colon tube. Produce hormone also that prevent ovulation. So usually, they assume when you are pregnant, you can't bleed, though there are exceptions. But that's the assumption. Menses shouldn't go on again. Then produces progesterone. Remember that progesterone was preparing your body for pregnancy. So once you become pregnant, they produce more progesterone to keep making your uterine wall stronger to hold the pregnancy. Then drugs from your mother. Mothers go to antenatal. The drugs they take, they have to pass it on to you. And it has to pass through that. Now, now that you know the placenta at that end, and has formed the tube called the umbilical cord, they've also asked before, instead of narrowing on the placenta, they narrow down the umbilical cord. And the answers we provided was that it attaches the fetus to the placenta. So not to the mother. So between the mother and the baby is the placenta. Get it to us. So the mother to the baby doesn't go straight. There has to be a placenta. From the baby to the mother to there is another from the baby side. That's a colon that mixes up. So everybody has something they bring. Now the connecting tube of these two are the umbilical cord. So when they pass something from the baby, baby pass something or the mother pass something, it is on the umbilical cord that though the placenta is passing it, it has to pass through the tube. So placenta is ready to pass something. It needs to go through the tube. So the vein in it, there's a vein and artery in the umbilical cord. The vein's job is to bring digestive food and oxygen, while the arteries transport waste metabolic products and deoxygenated blood. Then the umbilical, which is a strong cord, it's jelly-like in nature, but strong kind of cord, helps hold the baby in the watery environment to suspend it, to let it be able to float within the umbilical cord. Now the current portion, as we said, is the outermost of all, which covers the rest. Then they, because they're also forming the cord, they also bring about exchange of blood and gases from the mother and the fetus, and usually deal with elimination of waste. So when you go to the fowl, which we study in year one, the fowl, the egg, you see a big portion of chlorine. Because eggs don't have a way of passing out, the when the chicks are growing, they don't have a way of passing out to their mother. They keep all their waste in the chlorine. So the chlorine actually is like the waste bag or the waste tube things pass out. As I said, the chlorine and the placenta are all fused together and then they fuse to form the umbilical cord too. So it's like the one taking the waste out, we can logically conclude that probably it's more of the current portion that is taking this waste out. There are long toys also at the early stages for gaseous exchange and handles liquid waste. Then the amionic fluid or amion, amion, we say, we'll look at the picture again. It's the blue line we saw, which is the one very close to the baby. It's within, the current is the outer one that protects all them. It's within the current and contains a fluid called amniotic fluid. And this fluid has a <laughs> lot of function. One, it has a watery environment to allow the baby to be able to float or move, try to move their hands. By the time they even come out, they know how to throw their hands because they were in water. Now, it provides the warmth, the kind of temperature that they need. Usually, the pregnant women are a little bit hot, so they give them the utmost condition. Then, as a shock absorber, when you push, instead of they hitting against their mother's skin or anything, the water that kind of protects them as a shock absorber. So they can't hit, use their head to hit anything. 
because they are in water, the water would serve as a cushion or a pillow. Then they also serve as a buffer. A buffer is anything that resists change in pH. So things don't just easily change in that environment because the anionic fluid is for serving as a buffer. On your screen, I've also added a yolk sac. It usually works. It doesn't have a proper function when it becomes a fetus. Because it works well when we move from zygote to the embryo, when the current and other parts have not taken over, our placenta has not formed. So we say that they provide nutrition and gaseous exchange till placenta is formed. For animals that have large yolks, they depend on it. But for we mammals like human beings, in a short time, our parents, our mothers take over the nutrition. So let's look at your drawing again. So we have the blue line as the amniotic. Then just beneath is the chorine membrane. That's why I said the chorine is the one outside it. So look at the drawing where the orange color, there's a deep brown and there's a blue color around it. When we come to this side too, on your right, the amion is inside. Amniotic fluid is the fluid you see there. The chorine is just after the amion. Then look at the yolk sac, very small formed over here. And the alone toys usually is not even uh, shown on most of the drawings. Now, if there's childbirth, this same drawing, let's use for childbirth. Usually, at the ninth month, we assume the baby's head has to be down. The baby should not be lying in the bridge, what we call bridge, the flat way, the horizontal way, to make it difficult for the baby to come out. So nurses have a way of, and doctors have a way of turning them around, the midwives, so the head goes down. If the head is down in this posture we've seen, where it's facing the cervix. Then we say that the pituitary, posterior pituitary gland. When we started the first hormones, I mentioned pituitary, but that one was the anterior pituitary. But here I don't the posterior pituitary gland. They will send another hormone from the pituitary gland called the oxytocin. This oxytocin's work is to come and cause muscles around the abdomen and the pelvic to start contracting. Rhythmically, strong and powerful. It comes and it stops, it comes and it stops, and this one would gradually kind of rupture the embryonic membrane. At the same time, when they rupture, the amniotic fluid, which is slimy, will start to lubricate the birth canal or the cervix area so that the head can start to push. Then meanwhile, there will be dilation of the pelvic and the vagina, gradually letting the head come out. It takes time. So the first thing we want you to mention, usually, we mostly want the, or it something right from the brain, from the head, you know where you are heading to. If you can mention pituitary, you get your mark, but if you don't uh, mention oxytocin, you get a one mark. Then you tell us what it is. It brings contraction. Then from there, we move on to the rapturing. We've marked this with parents. Today I'm laughing because students would say it will break, then the fluid will be seen on the leg, and then they'll rush the person to the hospital. Then doctors will do something, and the child will come out. Something funny we marked. But some people were also telling the real thing. So they see the break. That was the fluid. So that break they are talking about is the rupturing of the membrane. Then the fluid they see is the amniotic fluid, which has a role to lubricate the cervix and the vagina. Meanwhile, the same oxytocin that has caused the contraction will also cause expansion of the cervix and the vagina, and the head which was turned downwards would be made gradually pulled out first 
then the rest of the body follows. When they finish bringing the baby, remember that there's a cord, the umbilical cord, which is connecting the placenta. So what they'll do is that they'll cut the cord and still tell the mothers to try to push and bring that placenta we saw, which is not part of the woman's body. It's not, so you see all this in the membrane. So the amniotic fluid will break. Amniotic fluid will break. The baby will come with, will cut the umbilical, leaving all these things behind. And the mother has to push these things out of the body. So the placenta has to be pushed. And we call it the afterbirth because they finish giving birth and they have to push it out. Another nice person that Wyeck brought, which took all of us by surprise, was antenatal care. What is it? We don't talk about it. We say the special or holistic attention given to pregnant women during their pregnant period of pregnancy or gestation, from the day they got pregnant to the day they will give birth, it's called a gestation period, a gestation or gestation period, to ensure safe delivery. And they ask, what is the benefit of this? Why do our mothers are encouraged to go? One, to promote hygiene. Then to let them eat well. Because they weigh them, they know whether they are eating well or not. Then to give them prescribed medication to give them the immune system to withstand the nine and what they will face. And other diseases that can easily, they can easily get if they don't take them. They also vaccinate them, as I say, immunity. They will vaccinate them to have strong immunity to fight. They encourage them to also do regular exercises. They also counsel them due to some emotional things they go through, or if they discover anything even affirming their pregnancy, they counsel them. Then they monitor the growth, the stage. They know each stage, what should be happening. If they are not finding that, because they take scans, they can quickly highlight, or uh, they can be alerted quickly to know what to do and resolve complication. If they do all this, be able to predict even the day you give birth, prepare for it, and give you a safe delivery. Now, this regular exercise, a question came on that was funny. They said that, list some of the exercises you expect a pregnant woman you recommend for a pregnant woman. And one of them was normal walking. So if they are pregnant, you need to guide them, help them to walk. Swimming is considered very good. Low impact aerobics, such as dancing, you can help them dance. Breathing exercises, cycling, kickboxing, <laughs> that one, you have to be careful. But skipping, jogging, slow jogging, just few jogs. It's okay. A common question, I switch on to the next one. A common question usually students fumble is the sexual characteristics, how we mark it. First, hair grow. You are not developed. Hair grow. You are careful with some words. The hair grows in pubic areas, not public areas, genital under the armpits. Now, development of powerful muscles, or we say we usually body become muscular. Now, there's increase or enlargement, we prefer the word enlargement in the sex, the size of the penis or testis. Now, we say deepening of voice. Uh, the voice become bigger, it's wrong. Your voice don't become the guy become deeper. There's broadening of your chest. Your chest don't become big. They become broadened. We were so careful with the use of the words here. And so painful students couldn't get this five marks. There's production of sperm or semen. Then there's a high increase in the growth rate. When you are from 14 to 18, all of a sudden, you just shoot up. Then there's growth of facial hair, mustache, or beard. So when it comes to the hairs, we don't see develop. 
Now let's look at the female one. And the female one to the same thing, hair grows in pubic areas. Then there's enlargement of breast or mammary gland. It's not developed because the breast was there. It's just enlarged, not developing. Broadening and enlargement of hips. So refer broadening. Then there's start of menstruation and ovulation when they get to secondary sexual characters. The enlargement of the uterus or the vagina. They are all separate points. I just bring stroke over there. They are all separate points. You can say enlargement of the vagina separate, enlargement of the uterus separate. Now, their body, when we say the men's body become muscular, here we say their body, their contour, body contour is rounded and become prominent. Most of them will say they, they get shape. It's not correct. They become shapey. No. We say the body contour become rounded and prominent. Okay, another question they asked, which all came from when I was describing the men's menstrual cycle, was mentioning hormones that are associated with secondary sexual characteristics. Remember, sperm production happens when you are in your puberty stage. Ovulation starts when a menstrual cycle starts when the ovulation stage. So they wanted to mention the hormones needed. And we started with follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, all these are for females. But I mentioned interstitial hormones when I said the males. Estrogen hormones, gonadotropin hormone, progesterone, and testosterone. These are hormones that are associated associated with our secondary sexual characteristics. Let's wrap up with some of few areas that comes in our exams to problems associated with reproduction in humans, ectopic infertility, impotence, and STDs, sexual transmitted disease. Then your screen are your birth control or contraceptive methods. We'll just run through the types, which are abstinence, rhythm method, where you look at your month before you have sex, coitus interruptus, which is called the withdrawal method. When the sperm is coming, you withdraw. Contraceptive pills, taking to stop menstrual cycle, foaming tablets, which is inserted before sex so that it kills the sperm, and spermicida uh, uh, creams that are smeared in the vagina with the same aim of killing sperm. Condom, we know, will not even let the sperm move. So they are barrier system. Then cutting and tying the, the sperm duct of men, vasectomy. Then ligation is the same thing, tying the fallopian tube. Then intrauterine devices, which are put in the uterus to prevent sperm getting to the egg, same as the diaphragm. These are all examples. Then they ask what are the benefits of contraceptives for a nation or an individual. One is to control birth rate. Once you control birth rate, we reduce population. Then they also make sure mothers are safe during the pregnancy. They don't keep giving birth and their health is safe. Then it prevents STDs, STDs like condom. Then once contraceptives have taken and you don't give birth just anyhow, you have time to take care of one child before the next. So we say that standard of living improves. Common STDs we have associated with our study is what we call the genital hepkis or herpes, the genital waps, the hepatitis, the HIV, Chlamydia, which is common, gonorrhea, and syphilis. These are very common. But the first three are not very common to our ears. HIV is also common, which is now on the rise. These are STDs you can mention in exams. Then what are the symptoms? Most of the STDs you see is discharge from the genital or organs, abdominal, abnormal discharge, 
We pass urine in pain in the men, usually if it's gonorrhea. There are sores around our genital areas, and there's itchiness in the genital areas too, and there's pain around the lower abdomen. So on your screen you have the what you have to do to prevent it. Keep one partner, as they say, avoid casual sex. Avoid contact with people who have these problems. They abstain or use condoms to prevent STDs. All what we discussed today were external fer internal fertilization. We've seen the benefit of internal fertilization. You protect the baby in a conducive environment. So there's a chance of probability of fertilization because the sperm goes to meet it, not like the external. Then embryo is protected from shock, as we said, from um, amniotic fluid. Then from external dangers. They also are prevented because you're in your mother's womb. Nobody is coming to take you away. The embryo also obtain enough oxygen and nutrients from the mother. So they, they don't need, when they need, they poop from their mother. So the mother has to always be suffering or eating to overcome that. And the excretory products of the embryo are quickly removed so that through the circulation of the so they don't keep a lot of waste. I know students are waiting for this se session or segment, the question time segment. We've tried to run you through things that have come in WASI and things we think can come. So go over it, think about it, and be ready for us to zoom in to our question of the day. And we'll start that with our question of the day or the one that we projected throughout the whole day. That list differences between reproduction in mammals and in amphibians. If you want to call us call us on the number on the screen Call us on the number on the screen and we are waiting for you. Zero three zero two two one one seven five seven seven six. Zero three zero two two one one seven zero five or seven zero six zero three zero two two one one seven zero five or seven zero six. Call us through that line and we'll gladly give you questions to answer a lot. Okay, let's look at other questions on our screen. We've seen this drawing already on the screen. We'll hope to answer by naming the parts. We also have seen something on this diagram also. We also have seen another diagram on this also. The same as this. So there are nine questions in the exams. Hello. Hello. Okay, let's keep 
So look at the sample number on your screen there. You, when you come, you can tell me the sample number you want to answer. Sample five, there was no drawing. Six, there's no drawing. On sample seven, there's a drawing of something we saw. So these are all past questions. Sample eight, you have no drawing. It deals with the contraceptive area we just studied. Then that brings us to the end. So look at the sample question number. You can just tell me the one you want, and I'll just flip to that zone. But let's try and answer the question of the day. Differences between mammals reproduction and amphibian reproduction. So the question on your screen now is, there is a male reproductive system shown. Which of the labeled parts can be cut to ensure permanent sterility? For Nigerian past question 2012, question 23. Then the testes in the male mammals descend into the scrotal sac because of what? Then question three, sperms in mammals are stored where? Which part of our productive structures do we store the sperms? Also, if you went through something you didn't understand, you can call in and ask for, for a clarification, or you can go to our YouTube, Joy Learning TV, there's a revision show that you can leave your comment and ask as usual, as we do, we'll come back here. Either we answer you over there, we'll come back here and give you the, the answer to the whole world. Maybe they're also struggling with the same thing. I hope you see what's on your screen, the drawing there. It says, the above is the drawing of a mammalian spermatozoan. Use it to answer question 20 to 22. Which of the label structure structures is the new plus? Three, which of the label structures secrete enzymes which facilitate penetration of the egg? Four, which of the following label structures is similar to the locomotory structures in Euglena? Ah, we lost our caller. So you can still call us on 0302 11705 or 0302 11706. You leave something on the YouTube too, our producers will know and inform us and give us the question and we can also answer your question. If you are not in the country, you are watching elsewhere, you can still send your question. Now let's look at slide three. I wanted to ask, is it, is it likely that we can, I'm, I'm, I'm in Ghana right now. Yeah, in Ghana, okay. Yeah, is it possible that your name, please. I'm Dory. Dory is calling us from. Oh, we lost Dory's feed. <laughs> Doris, try again, and we are ready to answer. You're saying, is it possible to, and I didn't get the question. So we have on your screen slides of questions. You can go straight to the sample. 
you want. Sample port is also very nice. They said the structure labeled I is there. So you look at the drawing, which structure is labeled I. You have to be careful looking at it very well. This is for Nigeria 1999, question three and three. Then question two, in which of the label structures does implantation takes place? Then question three, which of the following indicates the direction of the movement of a sperm introduced into the female reproductive structures? So you have to be careful and arrange the numbering in that order. Sample five, in mammals, fertilization usually occurs where? The fertilization, where does it occur? Is it the cervix, the vagina, the uterus, and the oviduct? Question two for sample five. The mammalian embryo attaches itself to the uterine wall by a process called what during the teaching we, me we made mention of it. Question three or sample five. The following substances passes into the blood of the fetus from the mother's blood via the placenta, except, except which one, they use the word except. Which one? Which one means that which one is not the correct one, except. So all the other three are correct. One will not be correct there. Question sample six. Which of the following activities occur during labor in female mammals? Oxytocin level decreases, cervix and vagina dilates, estrogen level increases umbilical cord lengthens two corpus lithium refers to what what is the corpus lithium during the discussion we mentioned the corpus lithium is the yellow body what is it how would you describe it when is it formed Sample seven. Hello. Hello. Yes. Kindly go on and good evening. Good evening. Where which sample question do you want to answer? Sample five. Sample five. Okay. Now in sample five, it says in mammals, fertilization usually occurs in the where in does the, the what? Uterus. Okay, you've tried. Let's finish marking and I'll answer you if they are right or wrong. Then question two. The mammalian embryo attaches itself to the uterine wall by a process called... The, the mammalian... Embryo attaches itself to the uterine wall by a process called... Placentation. Placentation. Okay. Question three. The following substances pass into the blood of the fetus from the mother's blood via the placent placenta, except A, carbon dioxide, B, glucose, C, virus, D, antibodies. Which one doesn't pass? Antibodies. Okay. Uh, you've done well. But almost all the answers were right. They were not right. So if you call in, you can help us get the right answers. Meanwhile, I'm waiting for the question of the day. We said lace depend between amphibians and mammal reproduction. If you get the gist, you know. Mammals are what? Amphibian are what type of reproduction?
so as a way we wait for you to call one of our biggest challenge are when students tell us they get to the exams they forget what they learn we always say if one read well discuss with friends usually at this stage solve questions reading your notes isn't the best for now it's solving questions you have topical book solving solve the when you find out you mark yourself and don't get some things right and you debate yourself go read a portion of the note solving a and b or if you can't even solve b very well you solve a very well the pieces put together becomes the note have a steady thing hello hello welcome please hello. which sample do you want to answer sample five Wow, sample five is trending today. Okay. Your colleague couldn't get them right. Let's go. Okay. One, imama, fertilization usually occurs in the... But in the oviduct. Correct. In the oviduct. Also called malignancy. Correct. That is very, very correct. Then the question two, the mammalian embryo attaches itself to the uterine wall by a process called... Implantation. That is correct again. The following substances pass into the fetus from the mother's blood via placenta, except one doesn't pass. Which one? Viruses. Wow. Mm. Okay. I'll clap for you, but the question three, watch it very well. But I've had HIV before. Yeah. But you know mothers can pass it to their child. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh-huh. So watch the question very well. <laughs> um, my my current work low, so I cannot read the questions on my uh, laptop. Uh, my uh, television. I like oh, to okay. read the possible answers. Oh, the possible answers are carbon dioxide, B glucose, C viruses, and D antibodies. Which one doesn't the mother give to the fetus? Then. It should be glucose. Uh, I won't let you give try again. I won't. Still, it wasn't right, but let a colleague come in. Or let's yeah. go to another slide. Okay, go to another slide. <laughs> so please try and read the uh, possible answers for me. Oh, okay. Then I have to look for one without drawing, because you can't see. Okay. Okay, question sample six. Mm -hmm. Which of the following activities occur during labor? In a, in a female mammal. Okay. A, oxytocin level decreases. Okay. B, cervix and vagina dilates. C, okay. I, think, I think that was right. That was right. Mm. But you see, A was supposed to be correct. They have said increase, but they just said decrease. So it doesn't make it right. Then okay. two, corpus lithium refers to the following, any of the following. A, a fertilized egg that is undergoing cell division. B, okay. a leftover graphene follicle after the egg has been released. Okay. C, a non-functional amniotic fluid. Uh -huh. D, the gland that secretes estrogen. No, 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 no. It should be B, it should be B, the leftover graphene follicle. Wow, that's correct. Out of your two slides or five questions, you got four out of five. Almost okay. 90 or 80 percent right. That's correct. Okay. But I don't understand why you got that one wrong. Uh, because uh, the other one, the carbon dioxide, you know, uh, by the process of diffusion, uh, I, I was thinking that maybe uh, uh, when the baby needs oxygen, it will diffuse in and those things. So I was thinking carbon dioxide will also diffuse out and enter inside the plant. Ah, no, no. It's carbon dioxide. Your mother will not give you his waste. Carbon dioxide. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you very much for calling. Thank you. So, thank two you. slides have been solved. You can call in. Now, five and six is done. So, you have to take between one to four, seven, and eight to solve. Mm. Oh, not you, not you. Let okay. others also call in. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. Okay. As I was saying, we are almost close to the end of our today's show. 
first read well, but you are in Form 3 now, as the WASI comes. You can have a short time for reading. That means you know most of the topics. Glance through the things. Ask yourself, as I do to my students, if you take a topic on the same reproduction without looking in the book, what do you remember? I remember this, I remember that, I remember this, before you read. Or you can write what you even remember before you read. When you read, you don't read for everything. You read for summary or key points. Discuss with a friend. Solve questions. Always solving will let you know whether you understand or not. Then when you don't understand a place and it's no, you go back, don't go and say, read that portion. Maybe reading it slowly will let you know that some areas you didn't cover well. Another way of learning to is always drawing something. Biology is descriptive. You're always describing a process or a structure. Draw the thing and look at it and use it to answer. Then learn everything to if there are two things that are so comparable, choose a comparable table. It will let you understand. Most of you read biology without looking at the pictures or trying to draw. Biology is all about description. And don't write plenty. In the exams, as you see us do, though we are trying to teach a letter around it, not like the normal teaching. Look at how we present the answers. Straight, straight. It looks long, but it captures what we want. Check your spellings, because we are serious about spelling, and follow the rubrics of our paper. And I believe you can get between a grade A and a B3. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today. It's an exciting journey through production. Maybe based on your request, you put on our Facebook and our YouTube. Whatever you put there, we will discuss. If you come another way, it will be on practicals. And all the tricks in practicals, we will look at it. So we meet again. It's been me, your facilitator, Asel Kwame Amwatin. That took you through the said a vision in reproduction. As Joy we say, Joy learning, keep learning. So we meet again. Bye bye.